That's um, not how the chopper's supposed to sound. Yeah, there's some kind of strange glitch with the audio that happens in the night mission sometimes. Ow. Today's Ancient DOS game is Seek and Destroy, one of my favorite games from the 90s and one that I wish was easy to get nowadays. And I've been holding off on this review for quite a while now, particularly because of how hard it is to get this game anymore. And I don't really like reviewing good games that are difficult to get a hold of because, well, if someone doesn't have the game, how are they supposed to get it? Yeah, I know, BitTorrents, download sites, etc, etc. I still hope that the guys who made this game put a fully legit, free version out at some point. Or maybe sell the game over GOG.com, just something so that people who never got the chance to play this game can try it for themselves. But yeah, as you can see from the gameplay so far, it really is as simple as it looks. Take command of helicopters and tanks and just shoot everything. If it moves, shoot it. If it doesn't move, shoot it anyways. If it shoots back, you're obviously not shooting fast enough. It's mindless and fun, and the perfect length too, as it takes an experienced player roughly two hours to get from start to finish. And every time you play through, you can always try things a little differently due to the extreme amount of customization possible, thus changing things up a bit. It's not a perfect game, mind you, but it's pretty darn close. And before we get into the details, let's just get those game stats out of the way. Seek and Destroy was originally developed by Vision Software for Amiga computers in the UK back in 1993. The original game only had helicopters to pilot, no tanks, and 14 multi-phase missions overall. The DOS version was later developed by Vision for both UK and North American gamers and published by both Safari Software and Epic Mega Games in 1996. It's a one-player 360-degree 2D shooter featuring tweaked VGA 320x240 256 color graphics and support for Sound Blaster and Gravis Ultrasound cards. Now, although the Gust support is mono only while the Sound Blaster support is in stereo, the Gust driver works much better under DOSBox, so unless you're playing on actual hardware, that's the audio mode you should use. Besides, the stereo support for the Sound Blaster is a bit buggy to begin with, so Gust support is just better overall. As for its current release state, it was originally sold as shareware by Epic Mega Games, and while the Epic Classics website does still exist, it hasn't been updated since 2008 and they've never returned my emails, so I have to question whether or not they still actually sell anything. So the best way to get Seek and Destroy nowadays is to hunt down the boxed version of the game, or at least the disc that came in the box. This is a difficult prospect though, for three reasons. First of all, all three copies on eBay right now are a bit sketchy on their details, so it's no wonder they haven't sold yet. 
Secondly, this is another game that BNN did a release of, and they were notorious for releasing pay copies of the shareware versions of games, rather than the full registered versions. However, I have seen a low quality picture of the back of the jewel case for the BNN release, and one of the screenshots on the back shows the star-shaped blast of the maxed out napalm weapon for the chopper, which is not obtainable in the shareware version. So that could be a good sign, but again, I can't know for certain, it could just be false advertising. So if anyone has any details on that, please let me know so I can add them below this video. I know I keep saying that for all these games released by BNN, but seriously, researching information about these BNN releases is virtually impossible. Lastly, there's another game called Seek and Destroy, released for the PlayStation 2 in 2002, and besides the fact that you drive a tank in it, it has nothing to do with this game. It also happens to be a heck of a lot easier to find, so most of your searches for this DOS game will probably pull up that PS2 game instead. And this is why I've been holding off on this review. I wanted to find some way to make it easier for all of you to try and find this game for yourselves, so I just can't come up with anything. And this game's just too good to let rot away on my hard drive, so let's get on with the game itself. Now, the ultimate goal of Seek and Destroy is to take command of a US soldier in some war somewhere, engaging in five missions, each split into four phases, all culminating in a final mission where you take out the enemy commander's base, preferably while the enemy commander is still inside. Yeah, there's not really much to go on here, but then it's kind of curious that the soldier you're playing as seems to be well trained in commanding both choppers and tanks. Before each mission, you're given a briefing telling you what you need to do in order to win the mission. While most missions are nothing more than go here, shoot this, win, many of the missions, including the first one, also require you to pick up POWs or drop off specialists at particular structures, then pick them back up at some point. You're also able to go to a special shop where you can spend your hard-earned medals on new and better equipment. Then, when you're ready to start a mission, you're presented with the Equipment Selection screen. This screen can be very intimidating if you don't know what's going on, so here's how it works. The top part of the screen shows your weapon bays, 6 on the chopper, 4 on the tank. The first weapon bay is always equipped with your chain gun, which has unlimited ammo, while the remaining bays can be set to any of the weapons you have access to. You can also set multiple bays to the same kind of weapon in order to start the mission with more ammunition for that weapon. In the bottom left corner are your super weapons. Although you have access to all of them, you can only select one of them to bring into the mission with you. We're going to talk more about all of these weapons in detail a little later. The bottom middle allows you to adjust the balance between fuel, armor, and speed. Modifying these values takes a little practice, but essentially, when you add or remove fuel or armor, it changes your overall speed, whereas if you alter the speed bar directly, your fuel and armor will be balanced out for the amount of speed you want. At minimum speed, armor and fuel are both maxed out, and at maximum speed, armor and fuel are both minimized. I don't recommend setting any of these values into the red zone, because you can seriously handicap your vehicle if you do this. Lastly, the buttons in the bottom right let you start a mission, go back to the briefing, or switch between commanding your chopper or tank. Though a handful of missions force you to pile the tanks, so you're going to want to get acquainted with both of these vehicles. Your choice of whether to fly the helicopter or command the tank is going to mostly come down to which you feel the most comfortable using, and both have their advantages and disadvantages. The helicopter is definitely the most maneuverable of the two, as it has the ability to strafe sideways and moves much faster than the tank for the same amount of speed. The tank, on the other hand, can turn its turret a full 360 degrees, allowing it to move in one direction while shooting in another, and can take twice as many hits for the same amount of armor. Another consideration is that the tank is far more powerful versus ground targets than the chopper, but the chopper has a more varied array of weapons at its disposal. All that said, the chopper has some additional considerations depending on the difficulty level you're playing at. There are three difficulty levels you can choose from, low, medium, and high. The main effect this selection has is how much damage you take and how quickly the enemies can fire at you. Medium skill doubles the damage you take from low skill, while high triples the damage you take, and enemies fire shots about twice as fast on high as they do on low. Also, if you're flying the chopper, playing on higher skill settings requires you to land more frequently. On medium skill, you have to land to pick up metals to spend in the shop, and on high skill, you also have to land to pick up armor and fuel power-ups. Also on high skill, you have to make sure you touch down while at a standstill, otherwise you'll be instantly destroyed. Thankfully, unlike the vast majority of games out there, you can change your difficulty selection anytime you want, including mid-mission. And yes, your skill selection is perfectly remembered when you save and load your games. So, let's talk about the weapons. There are 9 different weapons for the chopper, and 7 different weapons for the tank. 
Every weapon has a purpose, and most of them can be upgraded to three levels of power, except for the super weapons. However, you can also skip upgrades and just buy the most powerful version of the weapon you want. It takes longer to get a weapon at all this way, but allows you to get the more powerful versions of those weapons sooner, and for less money than buying the weaker versions first. Regardless of which vehicle you're commanding, both the tank and chopper have access to a chain gun with unlimited ammo and airstrikes. The chain gun only does minimal damage, but when you're not in a critical situation, it's a good way to keep from running out of ammo, and it's also very effective against weak targets like infantry. Both vehicles can upgrade to dual chain guns, but only the tank can upgrade to triple chain guns. The chopper instead gets a swivel mounted turret to spread the bullets around. Airstrikes, on the other hand, are really expensive, take several seconds to call in, barely do any damage, and cannot be replenished with power ups during the course of a mission. The only plus side is that once you target an area to strike, you don't have to keep that area in view for it to get damaged. Almost every other weapon in this game requires you to actually visually see your target in order to do any damage to it. The chopper's initial weapon of choice are forward firing rockets. At first you fire them in pairs, but can upgrade to a triple shot and a quad shot. Early on rockets are extremely effective, but later on it's hard to carry enough ammo to make effective use of them. In fact, you may even opt to stop using rockets entirely and focus on the chopper's other weapons, specifically air-to-air -air missiles and air-to-ground missiles. Both kinds of missiles come in a dumb fire variety, which only goes straight ahead, and also come in two homing varieties, single firing and dual firing. The lock-on system for these homing missiles is extremely effective and completely automatic, so I recommend skipping on the dumb fire missiles and just going straight for the homing missiles. The chopper also has access to napalm. Now, this is a ground-based weapon that you only get very limited ammo for because it is extraordinarily powerful. The first variety simply spreads forwards, the second variety spreads a triple stream forwards, and the third variety releases a starburst of napalm doing tons of damage to every ground target nearby. As for the chopper's super weapons, it has access to mega missiles, super napalm, and bombs. Mega missiles come in a fairly sizable stock and only hit a single target, but do really good damage and can be fired rapidly. Super Napalm releases a long range spread of really powerful napalm that will destroy anything it touches, but you don't get many shots of it. Bombs are similar to airstrikes in that they damage several targets at range, and you don't have to have those targets in view to damage them, but they're a heck of a lot faster to use than airstrikes, and you can replenish them from finding power ups. The tank, on the other hand, only really has two unique weapons that you buy in the shop, shells and flamethrowers. The shells are initially fired one at a time, but you can upgrade first to rapid fire, then to dual fire. For what is the tank's staple weapon, the shells are extremely effective at dealing damage and running out of ammo is next to impossible, unless you have really bad aim. The flamethrower, on the other hand, mislabeled as napalm in the shop, shoots a constant stream of fire that's good for taking out weak targets or targets that are behind something more solid that you're having trouble getting through, since it damages all targets in its path. The drawback is that it's not very powerful, even when fully upgraded to fire dual streams. The tank's super weapons include power shells, ground to air missiles, and mines. Power shells basically pass straight through targets, obliterating anything in their path. Ground to air missiles can only target helicopters, but lock onto them and are very effective at taking them down. Plus you get so many of these missiles that you never run out. Mines explode a couple seconds after you drop them, severely damaging or destroying anything caught in the blast. Thankfully, you can't hurt yourself with these things, but you do have to drop them fairly close to your intended targets, leaving you vulnerable to attack the entire time. And yeah, the rest of the gameplay should be fairly obvious. If you run out of fuel, you die. If your armor gets depleted, you die. If the mission involves friendly people and too many of them get killed, you fail the mission, lose a life, and do the whole thing over. You have a forward-facing radar showing you everything in the immediate area, and it can also zoom in automatically if desired when you're near certain areas. And if you ever run low on fuel but can't easily get a fuel power-up, just head back to base because when you land or stop on the pad where you started from, your vehicle is completely refueled. Though you have to rely on power-ups to restore armor and ammunition. So let's talk strategy, because there's a number of things you can do to stay alive in this game. My first tip is to never take more than a couple additional weapons into a mission. If you load up too many different kinds of weapons, you'll not only run into issues trying to cycle to the exact weapon you want to use, but you'll also end up running out of ammo for specific weapons frequently because of the frequency of the weapon power-ups, which is based on how many different weapons you have and not how many slots they're using. 
Basically, the more different kinds of weapons you have, the more you have to use all of those different weapons in order to not be constantly running out of ammo. It's much easier to just stick with a couple weapons loaded multiple times. My next tip is to stop using rockets as soon as you can afford the homing varieties of both the air-to-air -air and air-to-ground missiles. Yes, you'll have to switch between them frequently, but you'll not only run out of ammo less often, but you'll also be able to destroy targets without having to aim, which is a huge plus and something the tank can only dream about. Speaking of the tank, if you take it into a mission with helicopters, be absolutely certain you select ground-to-air missiles as your super weapon, because the helicopters are very tricky to take down with your shells or flamethrower. You also want to be careful not to drive over the stop here spots unless you really intend to stop there, because the instant you drive over them, whatever it's supposed to trigger will happen, and if you're not prepared for it, you'll likely get some friendly units shot down and be forced to restart the mission. Another big tip I have is to be aggressive. When you destroy four targets in rapid succession, you get a special overkill message, which is worth bonus points at the end of the mission. Every 15,000 points is worth an extra life, up to a maximum of eight at a time, and extra lives are essential if you're not too experienced with the game or are playing through the game without saving. You can maximize your overkills by waiting a moment after you get one before you destroy anything else, since you can only get an overkill once every few seconds, but this could play havoc on your fuel level, so I don't really recommend this tactic. One tip that's kind of strange is that if you're not quite prepared to fight something that's at range, spin it off screen so that it's behind you. Seriously, the enemies in this game will not fire if they're not at least almost on screen. Now, this gets even stranger though in that if you scroll an enemy's shots off the screen, they still get processed, though your own shots will disappear if you scroll them off. So basically, this tactic works to stop an enemy from firing more shots, but it doesn't do anything to the shots that they've already fired. My final tip is to only buy the exact upgraded weapons you want. The entire game has 110 medals to spend, and in order to buy the best versions of every weapon in the game, skipping on the weaker versions, you need 85 of those. Mind you, the airstrikes are pretty useless, and they make up 32 of those 85 medals, so really, you should be fully decked out pretty quickly. Or, if you want a real challenge, try going through the entire game without setting foot in the shop. Granted, be careful if you do this, because the game has a tendency to crash if you go into the shop with over 99 medals on hand. And I guess the developers didn't think anybody like me would be crazy enough to try that. So that's Seek and Destroy, an awesome game following the chopper slash tank formula that many games both before and afterwards have used. If you can find a copy of this game, I highly recommend getting it and giving it a go. There's very few games out there that play like this one. Though, I'm aiming to add another one to the mix in the coming months, so make sure you keep tabs on my website because I'll be revealing details about that soon. DOSBox settings are mostly simple. The Max and Auto settings have issues, so you'll need to set a fixed cycles count. I recommend a setting of 50,000. You also need to manually set the CPU core to dynamic mode if you want your frame rate to be anything decent. Also, this game has full analog joystick support, something very few 2D shooters have, and does it play surprisingly well, either with a high-end joystick or an analog gamepad. You just gotta make sure to turn off timed intervals, as well as button wraps, so you can assign rudder controls or shoulder buttons to the keys for spinning your tank turret. Heck, if you're really crazy, you can assign the left-right movement controls and the helicopter strafe button to those as well to give yourself strafe left and right buttons. Anyways, that's all for today's episode of Ancient DOS Games. Next week for episode 80, we're going to take a look at an indie platformer that had both pickaxes and wrenches long before Terraria was even a concept. And this one might be a little tricky, but if you think you know which game it is, then send your guests to 80 at pixelships.com and tune in next Saturday to see this game for yourself.